You are watching another episode of Shane Solomon Meets, brought to you by the Cornwall Channel. I'm your host, Shane Solomon, and today I'm very, very excited to introduce a guest, Graham Mitchell. So, Graham, it's been a long time coming. We've rearranged this date, but we're finally yeah. here. Yeah. And I'm super grateful for your time. Ah, oh, it's great to be here. Super grateful. Graham, I want to get straight into this. Now, first of all, you're Cornish, which I didn't realise. I thought you was someone that moved to Cornwall, had this wonderful career. No, yeah. born and bred. Born and bred in Lanner, uh, which most people know, I suppose, near a Druth. Indeed, this must be new to you then, electricity and everything. Exactly. In <laughs> Sewage system, you had a flush and everything. You know, you know. <laughs> so, you know... There's so many places I could go with this podcast today, but let's talk about your early um, motivations or your inspirations, so they say, yeah. to get into what you do as a career. Well, um, my father was a singer. Uh, he worked in Holman's, but he really was a singer. You know, his name was Sidney Mitchell. People might know of him. And he sang for years and years. So there's always performance in the family. My mother's an amazing storyteller. She'll... Um, yeah, she's fantastic. When she's relaxed, my daughter always tries to get her to tell Cornish tales, and she always does tales of the family and everything. Lovely. And she's a fantastic mimic. And my uncle um, was a writer. He was a he was a playwright. Uh, okay. He was born and brought up in uh, in Bizzo near Gwynedd, uh, and he went away and lived in Bristol and uh, worked a lot for Salisbury Playhouse and uh, and so on. Wrote a lot of plays. So when I was young, we used to go up. We used to take the car up from Lanner uh, all the way up to Bristol and Salisbury and places like that, which in those days took forever. I was going to say that, you know, yeah. You'd start off in the morning, 7 o'clock, and you'd be there maybe for a 7 o'clock show in the evening. It felt like that. By the time you got all the picnic stuff out during the day and sat in the lay-by and at your pasties, yeah, that's how long it took. But, yeah, so and it was really exciting as a teenager doing all that, seeing all that. Well, yeah. let's talk about some of the wonderful things you've worked on. I don't want to go missing any, but some highlights for you. What would you say are highlights your work? For me. Well, uh, I started out. How did I start? Well, I started out first of all in theatre. I was a. Uh, it was the day in those days. It was different. I'm in my sixties now, so back in the days when oh, I was. What's the in secret? My... You look younger than I oh, do. Oh, good man. Hey? Ah, Santa Claus. I was going to say, but in downhill paper round, you people wind me up. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, but I started off, um, well, years ago when I left university, I just decided I wanted to be an actor. And there were enough little theatre companies around at the time that you could sort of, if you were ambitious enough and you, you learnt enough along the way sure. and you kept at it, you know, and eventually I, I got a, uh, a full-time job with a company in Leeds and who were fully Arts Council funded in those days and we made something like four shows a year um, and uh, from scratch. And in that context, we did everything. We, you know, we, we were in the shows, we wrote them. We usually brought in a musician to write the music and, and, and play the music for us alongside us too. Mm -hmm. But there was a great training ground. You know, you could learn so much in those days. And it's a shame that's gone now. Those opportunities aren't there so much for young people anymore. Um, so I did that for many years, uh, right through my 20s really working mm -hmm. also and playing music and so on alongside that, just a creative life. Um, and then got into television. Uh, how did that happen? I'm trying to remember. Oh, yes. So um, a friend of mine I knew from Leeds, a uh, writer called Kay Meller, who went on to be very successful, Kay, and who very sadly died not so long ago. Uh, Kay uh, was working at Granada Television on a... a uh, Coronation Street and so on and she developed a little show there herself called Families which was a, a soap mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as is so often the way you know it's who you know you know you, indeed it's who you know you get the job because it's who you know whether you can keep the job or not that's up to you indeed, you can get yeah, your foot yeah, in the quite, door yeah, yeah, yeah. and I got my foot in the door through Kay uh, and I worked on a, as a storyliner on that soap for a while and it ran for I can't remember, three or four series, and eventually ended up writing on the show. And then from there, um, pitched ideas to The Bill, um, and they worked in those days. Uh, the, the Bill was a terrific training, training ground for young writers in those days because you had no guarantee of employment. You would just pitch an idea to your script editor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and your script editor would, would pitch it to the 
the producers on the show. Mm. And if they liked it, they would develop the idea. Sure. Uh, so when I started, they were doing half hour episodes of The Bill. That's how long ago it was. They eventually went to hour long episodes and it became like a little, how could you put it? Like a little writer's collective working on that show. There was a sort of core of maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 writers who would, who would write for that. And writing to deadline, you know, having to produce uh, an idea, create an idea that they would want to to go with. You'd be writing one episode whilst you're creating another idea, Crikey, yeah. you know. And then they're making they're making the first one. You're writing you're writing one in script form, and then you're you're coming up for coming up with ideas for another one. It was terrific. Again, fantastic training, for, for brilliant and wonderful show to work on. Real fantastic cast. Uh, uh, terrific production team, and I wrote uh, one of their live episodes, which was a I did see that. Yeah. Did you see that? I did see that. Yes, I did. Which I used was to be a massive bonkers. fan of the bill. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was bonkers writing the live show because um, it was wonderful because it was like doing theatre again. I wrote the show, and then we would uh, we got together in rehearsal rooms, and the actors were involved very much in in how the script developed. Um, but I remember on the shoot day, I, I'd written a stunt for it, and uh, a car had to basically go up a ramp um it would shoot up a ramp and it would roll and it would land on its side and then collapse onto its wheels and the the actors would get out of the car and we, we would go to an ad break as it landed so we had three minutes to get them out of the car right, okay. and, and reset for carrying on live and of course up it went up up the ramp and it came down it landed on its wheels went onto its side and flipped onto its roof. Now we go to the ad break ah. and the crew have got three minutes to get these actors out of the car. Oh, my goodness. Some, one of them had a cut on his head, the other one, you know, so clean them all up so that they conti could continue yeah, yeah. with the show. But it was brilliant to do. Wonderful. So I loved that. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 I'm just going to ask just one for a second. I can go on but and do you, on. no, no. But do you do you get to be in, so you write, for example? But then yeah. do you get to be part of the making process, the producing, being on set, and things like that? Not often. Right. Um, most directors like to keep the actor, to keep the writer away from the mm -hmm. set, primarily because actors uh, want to have conversations with the writer about their character. And I, I've done that before, where. Uh, an actor will come up and say, oh, it's a great script, and can you tell me a little bit about my character? And I I would do so, but that might well contradict what a director wanted from it. I so see. it can, can okay. confuse things. Okay. And also I think you don't want somebody else who's uh, who's got a lot invested in, in, in what's being shot around. You want them out of the way so you've got your freedom to shoot what you want to shoot. Indeed. Um, but also I've worked with some terrific directors who do invite you onto the set and, you know, People who tell you that I walked onto a set once and uh, the director said, oh, God, Graham's here, the writer's here, you know, um, and we've cut all his dialogue. <laughs> and they hadn't at all, really, but it was just like they shot it all visually. Sure. But, yeah, so that, yeah, you do. You can, yeah. you get to meet the actors and you get to work with the actors very often and, of course, you have a close relationship with the director and occasionally you get to go onto the set and uh, be in the way. But of course, it must be rewarding when you finally see it on television, for example. Or, you know. Do you know, I, I've i always avoided it. Have you? Isn't that weird? Well, no, it's I've not weird. I've always avoided not. it. I, uh, I'm like 50-50 with this, with guests yeah. and stuff. Uh, really? Mm. Okay, well, I avoid it. Mm. So um, with most material that I've written, uh, my family and friends love you know, when things go out live and they, they watch it or when it's first released, they watch yeah. it. And I tend to avoid it completely, partly, I think, because I've usually moved on to something else. And and, sure. and that's that's the past. It's like putting your foot back in the past. And I've usually seen, you know, uh, uh, the edit process, you know, I, they usually send, production teams will usually send out um, various stages of the edit for comments. Mm. So i seen it well ahead of time anyway have you been able to work your career mainly in cornwall have you had to travel well you know i was really worried about that i, I lived in uh london and then we moved up to york or I, I moved up to yorkshire and, and met my wife and had our children early years there in yorkshire uh and 
living in York, it's like, I think at those in those days it was sort of an hour or two two hours, I think, to London. So it was very manageable from there. But then the thought of moving to Cornwall, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be really out of the out of the mix. Um, but you know, I never found that. Mm. I never found I. I there was always the thing that we do when we live in Cornwall. We have to make the schlep. We have to get on the train, you know. We get on the 7 o'clock train, we get to London for a lunchtime meeting, you know, and you maybe you stay over or maybe you get the train back and if you're lucky and and you can get a seat in the dining car as it used to be, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's still going. It's, it's still it? there. But after COVID for a while, it was, I think it's back now. Because mostly now what I do, most meetings are mm-hmm. Zoom or Teams mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. I very rarely... I have to go up for meetings now. Most things happen like that. Uh, but in the days before COVID, when, when I did, you just have to, if you live in Cornwall, you have to accept that everywhere's a long way. And you've got, to, you've got to make the journey, you know. And great. Yeah. Journey can be part of the story sometimes. Absolutely. Talk about a story. I mean, it fascinates me. I can't write. We was talking before we went live on here about writing bits and bobs for, a, you know, funding for the Cornwall Channel. And I just find it very frustrating writing in its actual form. I can write, but just, you know, but where does it all start? Where does the inspiration come from? Because mm. your imagination, I mean, I see myself as a creative, but your imagination to write these things and, you know, where does it all come? Where do you pull that resource from? Paying the mortgage, mainly. <laughs> yes, quite. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming the end of the month. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think it's like um, whatever you do in life, whatever you're, the, the arena that you operate in you and, and wherever you find yourself and it and it fits and it suits you uh, it suits you because you have those capabilities whatever they are I'm not a very practical person so I'd really struggle to do anything practically and I really envy people who can and who can see that and I can't see it mm. um, so I asked the same question of a builder how can you build that how does that where do yeah. you start yeah. it's the same and they asked me how do you possibly write that was the same. Yeah. You know, horses for courses. But it's the mind, but, right? I guess yours is a lot in the mind. You must have a very active mind. I don't know because... Well, I like people. Mm-hmm. I love spending time around people and I love talking to people. So, for instance, um, when I used to go to London a lot for meetings and I'd get that uh, restaurant car back on the train, there was a woman who who used to run that car on the six o'clock, I think, she, from Plymouth, I won't say her name because I probably got all this wrong. <laughs> but she, um, I remember once, if, if you were a regular traveller uh, and the, the restaurant car was really busy, she'd kind of tip you the wink outside a little bit, I'll try and get you a seat if I can. But of course you'd always be sitting with other travellers, people you didn't know and they didn't know you. Mm. But over time I began to realise that I was always sitting with people I had a lot in common with. And I said to somebody once I was sitting with, you know, you work for Sky TV and, and you're a you're a foreign correspondent and this, the other person had some relationship to media as well. I said, this is extraordinary coincidence. And the other guy said, no, the, the woman who runs a restaurant car, she earwigs conversations and over time she socially engineers. Amazing. So you're sitting with people that she's deliberately sat That's you with. wonderful. I like Isn't that. Isn't that fantastic? That's great. I love that. So... So straight away, she's an extraordinary character, isn't she? she, she you want to build a story around her. Absolutely. Because she socially engineers her world. It's fantastic. So suddenly a, a story can can come from that place. Sure. Well, or, or anybody that you meet in well, that environment. inspirations are everywhere for you, They're I guess, everywhere. in everyday life. You know, exactly. if, I, if I ever watch anything on TV, uh, you know, of a kind of bold fat guy who's trying to make it in television, I think, <laughs> God, I wonder if he, like, picked up on this, you know, um, thing at the Cornwall Channel. But, yeah, so inspirations are everywhere, right? Yeah, and a lot of what I do is crime. You yes, know? indeed. So, well, so, we'll get on to Silent Witness in a minute. Yeah, yeah, but you're going to hit a lot of the work that I've done over the years has been crime. So you've got, there are certain things you need to deliver for a crime audience. You know, obviously there is the crime and there's the twist and the puzzle of, of leading people through it. And part of the, the journey of watching a crime show is, is trying to second guess. Coming, you know, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you're trying like, to oh, second I'm... guess it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do second guess it, it's really satisfying, but it's even more satisfying if the writer's, confused you and, and and misdirected you and you you you've got a you've got the twist and the surprise at the end that you didn't expect and everything in retrospect makes sense because of that so part of it is when you're writing it is the relationship with your audience it's straight up we were talking about stand-up comedy and so on recent as recently 
And back, back in my days as an actor and performer, it's the same. You have a direct relationship with your audience and you are, you're working with them to, to create a satisfying experience mm. for them. You know, mm. and part in crime, it's certainly that. So it, it, there's not a huge difference in some ways between the role of an actor, as I've experienced it, and the role mm. of a writer is still mm. about the relationship with the audience. It's, you know, it's about that dynamic. And so there are certain givens when I write a crime show, you know, that you, you need to have a, you need to have a baddie, mm. you know, you need to have someone investigating that. Mm. And you need it to have some sort of social content. That's, I like to give it that. You know, I like it to be about something more than just the crime. Sure. You know, I like it to be... A, 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 the, I've written, I think, eight episodes, eight stories for the for Silent Witness, and they're all about... Ostensibly, they're all about um, the central characters solving the crime. The, you know, the, the pathologist character, you know, Nikki, played by Amelia Fox, leading that team. Mm. to solve the crime but actually that's that's what happens on the surface below the surface it's about homelessness or it's about terrorism or sure. it's about whatever mm. you know so yeah also BAFTA nominated as well I mean these are great yes I was nominated you know, yeah. for for an award for, for BAFTA. Didn't win it, unfortunately. Outrageous, isn't but it? But still, they always say it's great to be... It's, it's huge to be to nominated. Be. Come on. It I is mean, lovely it to is, be nominated. You know. It is. Um, and, of course, the wonderful thing is nobody knows writers, so you can walk down the red carpet and everybody's going, who's that? That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's because we was kindly introduced by Jeremy Sneller, who a yeah. big shout-out to Jeremy. He's a lovely yeah, man. fantastic, Jeremy. And thank you very much, Jeremy, for you know making me aware of this wonderful man's work. My question to you, one that I really wanted to ask, was as the industry that you work in changed a lot because in my industry Absolutely. right it's like back in the day i used to carry these big cameras around big ones and now i can get it pretty much on my phone to some degree yeah. but from a writing point of view i guess the only thing that really would have changed is you've gone from quill and paper <laughs> into a tablet maybe i don't know but has it changed much to you well the technicalities of writing uh yes i mean i remember the days when uh, i would write a script and have to, to print it out and put it in the post you know, when I first started, Indeed. that's how it worked. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's crazy when you think. I know about it's crazy. It does, does sound crazy, doesn't but it? great for an excuse as well. You know, you know, when somebody called you up the next day and said the script doesn't arrive, you go, "Really? Yeah, <laughs> the post is terrible." So you know, now with instant <laughs> communication, there's no excuse. But um, so that the technicalities in that way have changed, of course, and word processing terrific. Most importantly of all, with the internet, I mean, you know, talking to young people, it's just part of their lives. But I think you're probably the age too now, aren't you, where you remember pre-internet days? I do remember yeah. pre-internet days, yes. So if you needed to know anything back in those days... Well, encyclopedias. And encyclopedias, yeah, the library. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, and in Cornwall, there's not a lot of that available to you. Yeah. So, but now you've got the world at your fingertips, essentially. So in terms of research or tracking down someone who you can talk to to give you information it's all there so yes. but i think the television industry you'll have seen this yourself i know you will but the television industry has changed so much oh my goodness well they're onto i can't remember the last time i've watched anything you know as it was being broadcast so it's a lot yeah. on demand yeah. we all live busy lives well i certainly do and there'll be things i've just not caught up with and we'll either binge watch it yeah you know on one of the kind of on-demand platforms um, but yeah, it totally changed, doesn't it? You know, I remember Completely. those days sitting down at home watching with my parents at Coronation Street. You mentioned earlier on, you know, things like that, EastEnders. Yep. But now it's very rare. Well, back in the Bill days, you know, we would get audiences yeah. of, I don't know, 15, 20 million for an episode. Yeah. Well, that's right, because there's only four channels back then. There's only then. four channels. So you've got almost, well, I don't know, a third of the population of the country practically sitting down. Mm. Is that right? Not quite that much, but Probably a lot. About 65 million, they reckon, roughly. But, yeah, you know, so a quarter. Then. Yeah. But you know, a lot of um, a lot of people watching it because there was limited choice, and then we did that thing of flicking through the channels. I was talking earlier. That's right. Yeah, you Channel flick through the yeah. channels because there weren't many channels to flick through, and you probably watch whatever was on. Yes. You know, uh, whereas now, now it's much more about your how you market your work. Your you know how uh, even even shows you know big name BBC shows mm. rely so much on word of mouth. You know, Happy Valley recently, Sally Wainwright's wonderful television series. Um, I think there was, it, that show to me almost worked like a like a streamer show. 
it was word of mouth. You know, mm. it was that's a great show. You should watch it. It happens to be on the BBC. It's not on Netflix or whatever, but it's on the BBC. But you should watch it. You can watch it. And watch it on catch up. Mm. So you can do that thing of binge watching a TV series, which we could never do. So it's more like almost it's more like reading a novel now than it. Yeah, you know. And do you think there's more opportunity for future upcoming scriptwriters now than there was back in your? Or do you think it's had its? It's a lot harder now, or is it easier? Ooh, I think everything's harder mm. now. I think partly, I think it's harder because there's very little uh, state funding of the arts, so it's difficult to learn your business, to learn your trade uh, through uh, through subsidised um, employment. That's really difficult. So I, I was so lucky to have all of that um, in, in my young days so I could learn my trade. Mm -hmm. you know? So learning your trade is difficult. Mm. Um, also, those shows like The Bill, for instance, where you would have, I don't know how many episodes there were of that a year, there were probably something like 50 plus episodes a year. So there are opportunities for young scriptwriters to come on there and learn their, learn their trade. Because it is, it's a craft, it's a trade like anything else. Mm. To come on there and learn your, you learn your business. Those opportunities aren't there anymore. But what there is, I think now is, um, is it, because so many shows are what they call authored, that they have a particular voice. That, that each of the episodes, you might have an eight episode series that tends to be written by the same writer or team of writers. They're looking much more for, for that, for that voice, for that new voice coming through the especially especially young voices mm. you know, there's channels that the television is a young medium um always has been and always will be streamers are looking for young voices so there are opportunities for young writers but it's like i've said earlier a lot of it in this business is who you know absolutely and i think we culturally especially in the uk i think less so in the states we're a bit embarrassed by by the potential nepotism of that, you know. But as I said, you know somebody will get you through the door. If you want to sustain a career, it's up to you and your own talent, your own hard sure. work. So sure. you, I, I would say to young scriptwriters, if you have any advantages like that, of course, use them. Mm. Um, uh, and write what you want to write, you know. Uh, there's a tendency always to go, what does the market want? Or at the moment, we're all watching such and such a TV show. I'll write something like that. Mm. And by the time it's landed on somebody else's, someone's desk, you can make a decision. Sorry, it's yeah, gone. Yeah. It's gone. They're writing. They're wanting something else. Mm. Um, and you have to be very resilient. There's a lot of rejection, as we know, in this business. Um, people want to say more no's than they want to say yes, of course. But um, if you're if you're resilient and if you stick at it. Um, and you find your place, then there's huge opportunities. I mean, of my generation, how many people made it really, really, I'm not talking about my level of, of work, which is senior, but mm -hmm. people who made it really, really big, you know, Sally Wainwright is, is one, one of them. Russell T. Davis is the other one, I would say. Very other, very few other people in, in the UK industry have, have been that successful sure but there's always the opportunity for that and that you know even if you don't make it to that level which i never did but if you make it uh, wherever you make it along the way it's a hugely satisfying and rewarding business to be involved in and to have made and still be making my living you know as a as a writer for this medium is such an extraordinary privilege do you think you ever retire has the word retire come into your head will i retire um yeah I, mm -hmm. I, I expect when they stop wanting to make anything that I've written, then mm -hmm. I'll find another other things to do. Yeah. I can't imagine ever retiring from making story work for me. Sure. Story has always been the thing that I've loved and I've always I've it's always fuels done. Your... It fuels yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It absolutely fuels me. It's... I mean to visit you and your setup here today and seeing hearing your story, you know, extraordinary. And that's what it's about to me. It's about the fascination with people with those individual lives and how we all mesh together in our different ways and and what we make when we connect amazing
Indeed. And talking about connecting, I was just going to say, and it's you touched on it, it's who you know. Mm. And if I was to give any advice to a younger self, and I know that we've had uh, Vaughan Powell, who's coming in today yep. from a local college, because he was yep. rattly, I'd know his dad, and blah, blah, blah. Yep. So they knew me. And I said, well, funny enough, I said, I've got a fantastic script writer coming in, um, Graham Mitchell. I said, come along. I'm sure he won't mind. Um, but my advice to my younger self would always be, do you know what? Network more. Network, network, network. Just talk, me too. Talk, build those relationships, because you never know who you're talking to no yeah. and it was something i was never very good at and still i'm not particularly good well, at networking yeah well i was the same but, but it took me a long time i probably, I probably hit my 30s until i started attending places and finding my niche yeah. people i wanted to speak to and yeah. and that great saying that to get comfortable you've got to get uncomfortable you know because i felt a bit uneasy going in these rooms mm -hmm. and you know but you keep doing it over and over and over again and and i've met people and then it's not until maybe another year. Yeah. Sometimes later, they crop up in your life, or you ring them, or now LinkedIn, all these wonderful yeah. things, and you're working together. Yeah, it's phenomenal. But it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe there's not that much difference in a way because you, you as a solo operator at that time, hmm. you've got to make the step. You've got to do it. You've got to find the confidence in yourself. Yes. You've got to take the deep breath and walk into the room. That's right. And as a scriptwriter, it's the same thing. You've got the blank screen in front of you. Yeah these days and you're the only person who's going to make a mark on that screen you know and it takes courage it does take courage but as we were talking we were talking to Vaughan earlier about this weren't we a little bit that it, as in it, it, our education system is designed that whatever you put on a piece of paper is it correct you do you write your essay you 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 sit your exam and that is what is marked and you're judged on that mm -hmm. Writing isn't that. Writing is is getting your ideas on the page, on the screen, getting your ideas out there, and having that raw material to work with to hone first it. First draft, right? To hone it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, first draft. Paul Paul Abbott, the great screenwriter, always said the first draft is to find out what's wrong with it, and that is exactly it. Yes. You know, and so um, and it takes a lot of time as a new script writer to get that into your head because we're so programmed to go, oh, God, I've written this. It's not very good. You know, I can't possibly do anything with this. No, it doesn't matter what it is. You've written it. Now you can make it good. Mm. Now you can work with that raw material and, and turn it into something that people want to read, people want to watch. Indeed. You know? And that that development of yourself as a scriptwriter mirrors your development as a as a human being, really. We're all, we're all first drafts. Sure. You know. Well, again, or whatever another, stage we're at. Yeah, exactly. Well, it comes back to another saying I live by, and that is, you know, you don't have to be great to start. You just have to no, start to you be just great. Have to you know, start. exactly. Um, and that's the thing. And I, I was the very same with the Cornwall Channel. You know, I just really wanted to work within television. I couldn't make it mainstream, so I thought, you know, I'll, just, I'll, I'll create a Cornwall Channel, and we'll go from there. And along the journey, I've just been constantly meeting amazing people. Yeah. You know, um, who all contribute. Yes. So it's not the Shane Solomon show. It's a, that this whole podcast is produced by Jay Kennett, you know, and there's a team that make this work, you know. Yep. Uh, there's people that design this kind of set. I had the idea of what, in, you know, wood materials to use, but there's someone that physically did that. I'm useless at DIY, you know. There you go. So people will show up, yep. you know, when you need them. Um, and this is the thing, collaboration. Yes. So um, there's a sort of sense, I think, in television certainly and in, in life in general that, that you're the person, you're, you're, it goes up, written by, directed by, produced by. Yeah, and mm. we do those roles. That is exactly right. But the mm. whole thing is a collaboration. Mm -hmm. So when I've written a first draft, well, before I've written a first draft of a TV show, I've discussed the idea. I've written a, a story outline, a sort of prose version of what, this, what the TV program will look like when it's broadcast. So even before I've started to write a script, we've, we've talked about it. Other people have contributed it's already, in a small way, a collaboration. Sure. And as the scripts go through their drafts, so they become it becomes more of a collaboration. There's always huge numbers of people involved in, in anything you do, and especially what goes out on screen and what you're doing now. Loads mm -hmm. of people involved who don't happen to be the two people sitting at the That's mic. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah. know, and without that collaboration, nothing happens. So. And that's life in general, I think. You know, we collaborate with each other and, and that's the way you make it work and you're open to other people and their influences and, and hopefully you can contribute to them. Indeed. And on we go. 
Oh, it's phenomenal. Uh, Graham, listen, it's one of those ones where I could just talk to you and talk. I've got so many questions I still want to ask you, um, but I'm always mindful of people's time, not of just course. yours, but producing time and the studio time. But it's one of those, hopefully you won't be a stranger now to no. our setup. And please, if you're ever passing, just drive on by. One thing before we finish, if that's all right. Yes, of course. I've got a podcast coming out, which yeah. I've done with a, a friend of mine called Ian Muir Cochran, who was a producer for BBC Radio um, final on four sure very serious documentary maker but we've made a a program of uh, six episodes set in cornwall called one dark night okay which investigates a mysterious death that happened on zena moore many many years ago which was um is believed to have been as the result of satanic practices it's become a big myth down that way and mm-hmm. as the the place where it happened has become a pilgrimage site for ghost hunters and and such like and so we have we've gone to we've, we've made a program which takes apart uh what really happened in the cottage that night and solves that mystery so look out for that that's going to be on all major uh podcast uh platforms uh at easter launching okay. at easter this year this is amazing so i'll make sure at the time send any kind of links to the publicity material, any graphics, any of that to point people in that direction. Yeah. And I'll make sure we put that back out on the Cornwall channel Thank because you. this is a thing, you know, Cornishman who yep. has so far achieved amazing things. I'm sure you'll just continue to keep doing that. And this is what I love about the Cornwall channel. We're constantly discovering amazing talent within our, within you know, Cornwall. Yeah, exactly. You know, lots of fantastic people living here. Yeah, You don't have to go anywhere else. In fact, people are moving here. It's that <laughs> exactly. Graham, and finally, is I was going to say, is there anything other than that you want to mention? Is there anything else I've no, 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 really want to no, get no, across? No, because, I, like I said, I'm, I'm going to put this on. I'm going to put this on. I'm so sorry, Jay. But um, the arts in Cornwall, it's a great yeah. big scene, isn't it? It's Huge. really buoyant. Yeah. The Hall for Cornwall, of course. Yeah. We had Julian Boast up the other day. Um, very responsible for pulling all that new regeneration together and all the funding for that. Yep. They do amazing things down there. So Tim Rice, I believe, is down here somewhere, and yep. I think we're close to doing an interview with him here. But the arts for you in Cornwall, what's your thoughts on that? And whether I mean, we talked earlier on about Bait, the film, with mm-hmm. Ed Rowe, and, and there's so many things, right? Okay, from a pure business point of view, mm. the arts is, I can't remember actually the statistic but i i think we are in the top 3 or 4 industries in this country in terms of, of revenue generated um and cornwall's missing a trick if it doesn't if it doesn't leap on that mm. bandwagon mm. so we've got mark jenkins who's produced some fantastic uh last two films in particular have got very well known denzel monk who's producing that yes, and other so things I denzel to somebody to talk again. to denzel's mm. terrific brilliant Make, doing yeah. a lot of wonderful things here We've got the Harvey brothers too, who are making extraordinary uh, films in this in, in Cornwall, but also um, uh, involved in theatre too. Uh, theatre director Simon uh, doing extraordinary things, and there's all manner of smaller theatre companies around the place. Many of them spawned from Nehi and what Nehi were up to oh, at that time. Yeah. It's a real tragedy that they've gone, but hey, everything has its time. Mm. Cornwall's a fantastic place for the arts. Um, Philippa Giles, I don't know if you know Philippa Giles, Screen Cornwall. I don't know her personally, but I've heard the name, of course. Philippa's doing some great things too. Uh, I think she's making a TV show set in Cornwall uh, in early summer this year. But also a lot of her work with, through Screen Cornwall is attracting attracting filmmakers to the to to to, to Cornwall to, to film and, and bring their business with them here. Mm. Uh the council needs to invest. We need to have the arts council. I know everything is stretched and difficult, but there's a lot of untapped skill, talent, potential in Cornwall that that, that needs nurturing and, and to some extent is being nurtured. But as with everything, as with your channel, as what I do, we all need financial support and mm. input, um, mm. you know. And, and channeling, I mean, th- from the point of view of the Cornwall channel, I said to you before we went, live with this yeah is that you know we've received no funding you know so every yeah. camera every Strong. lens every table every bit of carpet clapperboard has all been yeah. bought through doing promotional videos and things like that so the hard hard way um you know and i don't look for handouts but sometimes you do need that for a bit of a lift you do um but i have got another idea which i'm not going to say on this podcast because i want to explore it a little bit more but i'll mention it to you afterwards um but yeah, yeah. i'm really proud of what we have in cornwall yeah from young through old, you know, all different walks of life who's yeah. on the journey of creative because otherwise it could be a boring old world. It can. You know? 
It's a hugely creative place, Cornwall. Falmouth, where I live, you know, with the, oh, the, the students, the there, there's well, brilliant. Yeah. The university has yep. been a great hub. A lot of creativity in the in the town and spilling out mm -hmm. around it. Um, I think just from an audience point of view, just be aware of it, support it when you see it, you know, and understand, try and understand what it does for where we live, where how it puts us on on the map, how mm -hmm. we have our own identity in Cornwall. We're Cornish people. There is a there is a different sense of of place and culture here, and um, that's something we can be proud of and 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 enjoy and explore. And and lots of people I've mentioned the Harvey brothers and I've mentioned Mark Jenkins, Denzel Monk, lots of other people, Will Coleman and his and his. Um, yes, his extraordinary his things as well, as well that yeah, he's, he's doing. He's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. And they're all, they're all in a way, they're all an example of Cornish culture now, but that's on an international and international stage. It's, mm -hmm. it's looking out as well as being part of what, of what we do and, and celebrating our lives here. So, Indeed. Yeah. Oh, there's That's so it. much, there's so much. There I keep talking. I could, I could, I could. Well, listen, I do need to bring the podcast to an end. So thank you to every single one of you who've listened and watched to this. Keep, you know, watching this man's work is absolutely superb. Now, as always, if you know of anyone doing anything remarkable in Cornwall, please drop me a line, shane at cornwallchannel.co.uk. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Will Danette, who has kindly sponsored a podcast for today. A massive thank you to them. And until next time... Um, we'll find out about brass bands, we singing, will. and a whole lot more. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Thank you. Thank you.